Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to be looking at moving to Linux from Windows and trying to answer some questions, uh, take a look at some of the lessons learned, and then make some recommendations. Stay tuned right after this. So maybe you're thinking about coming over to Linux and giving it a try. Maybe you've heard about it. Maybe you haven't heard about it. So hopefully you'll learn a little bit about it from this video. Uh, there have been many on this topic, but uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of questions that people have that just aren't being answered, and that's why I decided to do this video. And so uh, let's, let's, let's dive in, and uh, let's start to look at some of the things that most people have been talking about. So we all know that Windows has a very large market share, and they always have ever since Windows was first released. Uh, in fact, in the desktop market, Windows commands about 79%, and then it's followed by OS X, and then uh, there's some unknown, those are kind of all grouped together, some other smaller OSs, and then Linux is about 2%. So it's not very big. Linux does not operate, uh, at least in the desktop. Now, this is looking at desktops. Now, on the server side, that's a completely different story. It's completely flipped. Linux runs the Internet. They are almost 90%, 95% of the servers that are running out there. Uh, Linux also runs on all of the largest supercomputers and do all of the high-performance work when they're looking, and also in the artificial intelligence space. But Linux is also used in IoT devices. They're in, they're in your, uh, they're in your, they're, your uh, uh, they're in your home apps that run your lights, they're in your thermostat, they're in your toaster, or they're even in your refrigerator. So Linux runs a lot of systems. So it's not a small market share, it's a very large one. But I think what happens when people are looking at the desktop market, they're really missing the picture here. And I really think you need to look at both the desktop and the smartphone because Android is Linux. And Android does run a version of Linux. And as you can see from this, if I put in the smartphone market, Windows market share is really declining fast. Now it's kind of flattened out the last few years. Uh, and there's been some trading back and forth between Android and Windows, and that'll probably continue for a while, but uh, that trend line is definitely headed down. Uh, iOS is, uh, is it's coming up slowly, but those devices are generally regarded as very expensive. So I think if you look at this from the standpoint of devices in total that are using the Internet, Windows only actually occupies about 36%. Uh, whether or not Linux will change, it, again, it's still floating along at the bottom, about 2%, about 1.9, somewhere around in there. It's very small in terms of that. But again, the devices that all these others are talking to is Linux. So why would you consider Linux instead of Windows? I think this is probably the first place to go. Windows 10 has been around for a very long time now. Uh, obviously, the 10 is the, the, the date, 2010. Uh, it, and when and Microsoft announced at the time that Windows 10 was released, this was the last operating system that they were going to number, uh, and so uh, they would they would push out new releases over time. They would produce fall and spring updates that would be major changes to the platform that people could use. Uh, but one of the problems with Windows is particularly now with the larger and larger core. CPUs coming out is we're finding that Windows is not handling that very well. Uh, I don't know if it's in the scheduler for Windows or in the architecture for the kernel, but it is clearly not able to handle it. Um, I know that there's some interest uh, that Microsoft has has stated openly that they are going to move Windows to a Linux kernel, and, and I think this is probably the problem that they're trying to solve. Uh, also, older hardware on Windows, <laughs> it really runs slow. 
the the more re, the newer releases of Windows that come out make that older hardware slower and slower. And you'll notice that particularly if the hardware that you purchased was in the era when Windows 7 and Windows 8 were uh, the, the default operating system that was installed on your machine. Uh, and as you upgrade, you'll notice that your machine is getting slower and slower. That's because the footprint of Windows is getting larger. The processing requirements are getting larger. And so that is taking a larger byte out of the older hardware and leaving you a lot less room to run your applications in. The other, one of the other reasons I hear a lot of people is they just don't like the Windows 10 interface. They, uh, uh, well, sorry, you can't change that on Windows. You're stuck with it. Then Microsoft determines what that look and feel is. And if you liked Windows 7 better, too bad. Uh, Windows 10, you're just stuck. Uh, there's... You could go out and probably recolor it. You could maybe change the, some of the borders and things with the themes, but you can't really do much about where it puts apps. Uh, the other problem is that Windows, uh, if you're on the home version, not the Pro, but if you're on the home version, it just schedules updates to occur whenever they feel like it. You could be in the middle of a movie. You could be in the middle of a game, and all of a sudden your Windows machine is rebooting uh, because it's finished with an update and it needs to restart. Uh, also, Windows updates take forever. They are really slow because they are changing everything. They're changing DLLs. They're changing the complete application. So they take an awful long time to download. They take an awful long time to install. If you've gone to the update window and you are patiently sitting there twiddling your thumb waiting for it to finish, you'll, that's one of the things that I remember doing a lot. I haven't used Windows myself in over... Ooh, so now, I did you have to use it at work, but uh, voluntarily, <laughs> I haven't used Windows since Windows 8.1 was the last one I installed. So, uh, yeah. And lately, the other problem that has been happening, particularly in, in the year 2019, is uh, we've installed things and things have break, broken. Uh, so it is definitely coming. They're not, they're not testing it as much as they used to. They're, you're the tester. You get to be the tester after a new release, and you find out that the system that you installed, thinking that this was going to be an improvement, wasn't, and it broke things at random. So let's, let's look at some of the questions that, and some of the things I hear. Windows is more secure, right? No, wrong. <laughs> Windows is not more secure. According to the uh, CVE, that's the Computer Vulnerability and Exposures Database for just one year, 11-6-2018 to 11-6-2019. Uh, you'll, we'll go down the list. Android had 414. Debian Linux had 360. Windows Server and Windows 10, 357. These are open vulnerabilities right now uh, that are in the database. Uh, and you can go down the list. You'll find the Linux kernel at about 190. Why and, and and so the other question is that we have here is wait Debian is higher than Windows why is that it isn't Debian is a Linux release well Debian is also the release that testers particularly security testers use and so they find vulnerabilities a lot sooner than they would in any other but the thing you need to look at is what not only at the number of vulnerabilities but also its severity. The uh, current CVE numbers, and <clears throat> we'll go over this, but <clears throat> they number the criticality from 1 to 10, with 1 being the least critical and 10 being the most critical. And so as you look at this chart between comparison between uh, Windows 10 and Debian, you'll notice that the largest number of vulnerabilities are in the red, and that is in the 9 to 10 range. Uh, and I'll explain what that is. Whereas in C in the Debian, you'll notice that the largest one is right here in the four to five range. But that doesn't probably make a lot of sense. So let's let's talk about <clears throat> what that means. So <clears throat> so the difference between Debian and and Windows is yes, Debian is higher, no doubt about it. Uh, it is always going to be the first place that that the security researchers find vulnerabilities because that is the operating systems that they use. Okay. Um, so uh, it, if you get above a certain point, if you get in the scores of 7 to 10, your computer is probably at risk. And in other words, there is a vulnerability that would allow an attacker to gain access to your information, to take over your machine, to install mal malware without having to be present. 
uh, on your site to do that. So uh, most of Debian CVEs fall in the four to five and six to seven range, which puts them in the uh, in the medium to uh, just shy of the high side. But in the medium, that those those kinds of vulnerabilities need to be fixed. But they usually require some on-site access for somebody to gain control of the machine first in some way physically before they can be exploited. But if you're up in the high and critical range, uh, vulnerabilities can occur over the network. So at least that's been uh, what I was always taught. <laughs> if you feel differently, let me know in the comments below. So Windows comes with my computer, so it's free, right? Well, not exactly. But what Microsoft did is Microsoft has a contract with all of the vendors like Dell and Lenovo and HP, and they pre-install they pre the operating system along with a payment for that operating system, which is transferred to you when you buy it. So that's basically what we refer to as the Microsoft tax. You buy the machine, it comes with Windows, you, are, you have a paid license as part of that cost of purchasing that laptop or that desktop machine. Linux, on the other hand, is completely free. You, uh, there, are, there are some distributions of Linux which charge for subscriptions, like Red Hat, for example, uh, and Ubuntu has a, a, a subscription model as well if you need support. But in, in general, Linux distributions, you can go and according to the license, you are free to download it and use it on as many computers as, you, as your heart's desires. It, you don't have to pay one-time licenses for every machine. Plus, you don't have to pay for upgrades. Those are also free. Windows has more applications than Linux, right? Mm, sorry, <laughs> no, it doesn't. Uh, my Linux distribution currently shows 57,601 applications that are, excuse me, available to, available to me, all of which are free. Now, and I have not looked lately at the free database for Windows, but it has been evaporating, and people have been charging for uh, even things that a few years ago used to be free. Uh, so every, you pay as you go on Windows. You want an app, you have to pay for it. You want something, uh, you want Adobe, you have to pay a subscription for it. You want Microsoft Windows, you have to pay a subscription for it. There isn't any of that on Linux. You can, you can again, download applications free of charge. They're open source. There are some in the Linux community which are, uh, which are paid applications, uh, and, uh, and you can use those as well. They're of high quality, and they're very good. And... And deservingly so, the vendors do. So I'm not saying that it's open source or nothing. I think it's find the application you need and use it. But in the in the larger number of cases, Linux applications are free. In fact, there are lists and databases of applications which which run Windows, uh, which run on Windows that also run on Linux. And I'll I put one of them here. I'll include that in the description. So things like VLC. Uh, and, and Skype and all of those kinds of things, those applications all run today on Linux. But what if you need Microsoft Office? Well, you can try LibreOffice Suite. It's 99.9% .9 compatible with Office. It has all the same apps. Uh, it, has a, 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 a desk, it has a word processor. It has a spreadsheet. It has a presentation system. It will take Microsoft files directly in, and it, it uses a format called ODP that you can use, or you can keep them in the same format as uh, Microsoft. And that can be PPT or PPTX, in the, for example, if it's PowerPoint, uh, and you're free to do that. There are also applications which are similar, but not compatible with uh, some of the other applications. And there are sites that deal with those. And I'll also include that information in the description below. So Windows is faster than Linux, right? Sadly, no. Linux is a lot faster. And why? Linux has a smaller footprint. Uh, the kernel is, uh, is a onion. It has two components. It ha and I know this is technical for those of you in Windows, but it has two components. It has a privileged mode and an unprivileged mode, or a user land, as it's normally called today. Uh, but uh, it is a very tight core, and most of the things inside of Linux are device drivers, which really comes back to this. 
on Windows, you have to install a device driver for every single thing you install on that box. So if I plug in a hard drive, I gotta have a device driver. If I plug in a sound card, I have to have a device driver. If I plug in, about the only thing you can plug in that doesn't need one is your headphones. Uh, your keyboard, your mouse, everything needs a driver on Windows. And Linux, those are pre-built into the kernel. So uh, you might run into a situation where something is new that Linux hasn't released a driver for, but that, I mean, that, that will self-correct itself in a couple of months. So, because they're that fast in turning around new Linux distributions that have those devices built into them. Uh, also, the Windows operating system takes an awful lot of space. It takes up a lot of memory. It, take, it is hard on the processor. Uh, it takes up a lot of disk space. And guess what? You're buying the computer to support that, and that's silly. Uh, you should not be <laughs> giving over half of the resources of your machine or even 25% of the resources of your machine just for the privilege of running Windows. I'm sorry. Operating systems do no useful work for you. Uh, it's the application that does, and Linux is just the opposite. It, 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 everything is small, tight, and fast. So... Windows protects my privacy. Uh, I'm trying to hold, my, I'm trying to keep from laughing. Uh, no, in fact, when Microsoft collects so much data on you, they had to build a new data center recently just to hold it all. Uh, but you can go ahead. I'll put a link to the uh, Microsoft policy, uh, privacy policy, uh, and uh, you can read through that yourself. Uh, just be warned, it is quite alarming on not only the types of data, but how frequently that data is collected. And frankly, it's none of their damn business what I do with my computer. And that's one reason why I stopped using Windows. Telemetry showed up actually on version 7 of Windows, and it got a little worse on 8, and it got really bad on 10. So also, Cortana learns not only what you're saying, but also the way you talk. It gets smarter by sending all that data back to Microsoft. And guess what? They sell it to Google. And Google, in turn, will, sell you, will send ads right back to you based on what you have told Cortana. Isn't that nice? It's so convenient that they do that. Um, Windows is, is more... <laughs> I'm sorry. I know I come off as a Windows hater. I'm not. I just, I just refuse to use it. <laughs> Windows is more reliable than Linux. Uh, if you guess, nope, you're right. If you guess, <laughs> if you guess the other way, you're wrong. Uh, Windows is just not as reliable as Linux. Uh, I've, I have personal servers here. I, I mean, I know there's servers and not desktops, but I have servers here that have not been rebooted in over three years. Uh, and, uh, and yes, I do application updates uh, on those. So, but I do security updates. I don't do kernel updates until I reach the next iteration where I have to do those and then I have to recertify them. But Windows applications uh, are, are really, really notorious for hanging the entire operating system. You could be running in, and I've seen this many times when I was running Windows, where the word processing app, Microsoft Word, hung, and not only did it hang the Word application, it also hung my presentation that I was working on. It also hung my terminal window that I was communicating with the servers on the back end with, and it hung my text editor that I was entering code into. So I had to reboot the machine, and I, and I had, had no opportunity to save that work. So in Windows, the lesson is save early, save often, and don't forget to save on the way out, <laughs> because uh, sooner or later, that bug will get you. And that is just the nature of the way the uh, an operating system is constructed. It does not have a true protected environment. Uh, whereas Linux, uh, everything is self-contained, and the kernel is protected from application crashes. It's just Unix goes all the way back to that was the intent of Unix, and that's the intent of Linux as well. So that's been in Linux for uh, as many years as Linux has been around. Uh, and that is the ability for it to survive system-wide an application's crash without affecting any other applications on the uh, system. Sure, you could lose the work in the application that crashed, no doubt about that. And, and let me tell you, applications crash. There are bugs. I don't care if it's in Windows or in Linux. It doesn't matter. There are bugs in software all of the time. And, and, uh, but you won't, lose app, you won't lose work in other applications that you are working on. Uh, Windows updates are great. Well, yeah, they might be great, but they sure do take a long time, don't they? And they also come at the most uh, weird, unscheduled times 
Uh, because Windows could reboot your machine right in the middle of a movie, right in the middle of a, of a game. Maybe you've got the beat on, on the boss, and all of a sudden your system reboots. Then guess what? You get to repeat that level again because you didn't get a chance to save. Uh, Linux doesn't do that. Linux will politely inform you that there are updates available, and then you can pick and choose the time that you want to install them. You can also pick and choose what you want to install. Uh, Plus, not all Linux updates require you to reboot a system. As I said before, I, if you're installing security updates, very rarely do you have to restart the entire machine. You might have to restart a service, but you don't have to restart the entire system. The only time on Linux where you might have to do that is if there's a kernel change, and I believe Ubuntu has a fix even for that. So, uh, But Windows has more variety. I can customize everything. Well, really, like what? I mean, you can change themes. You can you can uh, you can change your back your backdrop art, but you can't do much with the uh, desktop. You're stuck with what Microsoft gave you. You're stuck with the way they've arranged the window. You're stuck with the way they've arranged the uh, the options, and you're stuck with the way they present the menus. So, but in Linux, there you have a lot of choices for what desktops you want to use. Uh, some popular ones are Cinnamon, KDE Plaza, Plasma. Deepin is growing on people. I wouldn't say it's popular, but it's definitely growing on people. There's XFCE. Uh, they're, they're just, there's a whole bunch of them, and you can pick and choose from those. And even when you do choose those, you can customize the windows, the font, the colors, the backdrop, everything. So your heart's content. You can even... Uh, if you like the Mac look where you have a dock at the bottom, you can even do that as well. So you can basically change anything you want um, uh, that you want in Linux and make it personalized to the way you want it, including the, the short, uh, the uh, keyboard shortcuts to fire off applications, open and close windows. You can do all of that. Windows has better support. Well, Microsoft has a lot of documentation, uh, so when you get stuck, you, <laughs> you can, you, the only option you really have is to go to their forums. And I remember when I was, uh, when I was doing some development uh, on one particular uh, aspect of the system, I ran into an issue and put a, uh, put a question up on the forum. <laughs> and, and I think if you probably go up there, that was probably four years ago, it's probably still up there with no answer. Uh, so you're pretty much you're much pretty much dependent on on somebody answering your question. Yes, Microsoft support is actually very good, but you have to remember that they budget a certain amount of money from the license they collected to, from you to provide people to support you. So at some point, if you get deep enough in the question, they're going to charge you. They're, they'll charge you for that support. So uh, so just be aware of that. <laughs> you pay for what you get. On Linux, support is a lot easier to find. There are generalized sites which are dedicated to specific aspects of Linux. Uh, there are support forums for the distribution that you downloaded. Maybe it was from, uh, from Ubuntu. There are forums that Ubuntu operates and people are volunteers, of course. They're just you and me and people like that that are answering the questions. Uh, so um, you'll find that. Is it, yeah, I have run into a few times where people have asked questions on Unix forums where people didn't know the answer. And, and though there are some problems sometimes where that happens, but it's very rare. Uh, uh, so yeah, there's, they're very, and those forums are very active. Um, there's Reddit uh, forums uh, as well, Reddit uh, uh, topic areas where you can go to and, uh, and, and peruse through and find things. Google also, you can put in error messages that you're getting in Linux and just paste them into Google and they'll take you to the site where other people have had that problem and maybe you have a solution there you can try. Sure, people will be crabby. <laughs> You'll run into that, but that's human nature. Sometimes people just don't want to be bothered with your, your what they consider a stupid question. Uh, you can always ask me. I mean, I love problems, so if you have something that you, you don't understand or want to know more about, just let me know. I'm always willing to help. If I can, um, the other one is Linux is for technical people. I've heard this a lot. Well, Linux is an operating system with a collection of applications. It's, it's no different than any other operating system. They all do about the same thing. They, they manage resources on the hardware, and, and then they, allow, they manage applications that are running. 
So sure, yeah, there's there, you're going to find technical people on Linux. You're going to find, also, you're going to find computer scientists. You're going to find astronomers. You're going to find doctors. You're going to find lawyers. You're going to find people just like you. Uh, and yeah, there's even some of those evil marketing people around that use Linux. Nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you want to be technical, uh, yeah, we certainly allow that on Linux. You can be that if you want. Uh, but it's really for all ages. With the, you can buy a Raspberry Pi. And and you can you can become a maker and get your kids interested in that. So yeah, it, it, you can make it a hobby if you want, but you, you know you don't have to uh, be technical. I certainly won't chastise you if you aren't interested in the technical aspects of Linux. Uh, but you know the thing is, uh, Unix, which is the historical grandfather of Linux, even though they're not code related, was written for programmers, but it was written to write documentation originally. So. Uh, if you're a writer, I can't think of a better platform than Linux uh, to be a writer because the outgrowth of the software was for writing documentation and writing. So, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> if you're a writer, you're in the right place. I'm sorry, but Windows is not the right place for a writer. Uh, if you just want to movie, watch movies, pay your taxes, surf the web, that's fine too. Linux is a good platform for that. Uh, it's great, in fact, for all of those. And if you want to play games, you can play games on Linux, too. There's lots of sites that talk you through how to play the, your favorite game. on Now, not all AAA titles are going to run because some of them do rely heavily on Windows calls, and they may not work. But you can find out. Uh, you can easily find out about those. So. Uh, there's so many distributions of Linux. I'm, you know, what's, what, uh, so it, yeah, there are a lot. Uh, Linux is kind of all about choice, uh, and, it, and it's it's really about, it, you'll learn this as you go through. There's kind of a generalized use case for Linux. There's not one size fits all. But if you really want to learn more about Linux and, and, and you want to get started with it and you don't know anything about it, I would suggest starting with Linux Mint, and there's another one called Pop OS. I'll put links in the descriptions for this video below as well, and you can go out and check those. and and see what that's all about. But if you're a programmer or a developer, I would recommend Fedora because Fedora has tools for, that are much better for, just for uh, developers um, than any of the other releases. And, and Fedora is considered an advanced version of Linux, but if you're a developer, yeah, it's probably not gonna bother you very much. Uh, if you're a systems administrator and you wanna get your certification, uh, and you're you're probably going to be uh, in all likelihood you're probably going to be supporting a Red Hat uh, uh, installation. That they, they are certainly the largest vendor out there. Uh, I would start with CentOS because uh, you'll have 100% compatibility with the commands, and you can take your RHSE exams and get your certification to be a certified systems administrator that way. If you're a cybersecurity professional, I would I would either use Kali Linux or I would use uh, uh, Parrot OS and go there because those have the pen testing tools that most of the cybersecurity people use, and that's a good place to start with that. There, uh, there are certainly others, uh, and I'm not saying there's not. There are certainly others, but those are good places to get started. So, can I keep Windows? Absolutely, you can keep Windows. And there's a number of things that you can do to do that. Both Linux Mint and Pop! OS allow you to install Linux uh, alongside your Windows part. It'll, it'll take your Windows machine, and if there's room on it, if, you're, if your boot partition on Windows is full, this isn't going to work. But what it'll do is it'll, it'll shrink down the amount of size that Windows has, and it'll put that over for Linux to install side by side with it. So. You can do it that way. Uh, if you want, I'll talk about some other things that you might want to try in the beginning uh, before you take this step. So hang loose on that. Don't start with that one right away. So what about your Windows files? How can you get them moved over to Linux? Yes, you can, but that's a topic that's a little bit beyond what I hope to accomplish here today. It's very easy to do, in fact, and there's a lot of different things, a lot of different ways that Excuse me, there's a lot of different ways you can accomplish that. What about my Windows apps? Can I run them on Linux? Mm, sadly, no. Uh, Linux will not run Windows applications directly. Uh, it, is, it uses a different format called ELF, 
or x86 format that uh, uh, that Linux expects that file to be executable to be in. However, that doesn't mean that you can't run Windows applications on Linux. You can. There is a application called Wine is not an emulator. Wine, uh, and they have a database of applications that run on Windows that can be transferred over and installed on Linux and will run fine. And so you can go out to their site. Uh, again, I'll put all these links in the description so that you can find them. You can, uh, you can also install Windows under a virtual machine under Linux, and so you can move files, and you can also run your applications under there as well. So that's an advanced topic. Not going to cover that today, but uh, look for that in a coming video coming down the line. So uh, you're interested, maybe. I hope you are. If you got this far, you probably are. Uh, so what is it I recommend that you do? First, I would, there's a couple of things you can do. You can take and download a distribution that, that's called a live distribution. You can install that on a USB stick. There's going to be instructions on whichever vendor you go to, whichever distro you go to, to how to do that. And you, you do that from within Windows, okay? And then you can reboot your machine off the USB stick and you can play around with the live CD, the, the live version of the system and play around and get to know it without disturbing your Windows uh, installation at all. You can also download VirtualBox for Windows and make sure you carefully follow the instructions uh, uh, on the VirtualBox site in order to set up your BIOS. There is a setting in your BIOS you have to check to be able to do that, and that's to allow it to run virtual machines. Uh, and once you've done that, once you've got that installed, then you can install Linux. at the. There's an ISO version. It can also be the live uh, version of the system. You can put that on there, and uh, you can install it under a virtual machine, and you can run it at the same time you're running Windows. So that's a good way to get comfortable with it. You can play around, read the documentation, go through some getting started tutorials. There'll be a lot more on this. I'm not done uh, with this topic. This is just the first introduction into this, and I didn't want to make this 12 hours long. <laughs> so it gives you a chance to kick the tires on Linux, play with some of the applications. You, you know, one of the other fallacies is you have to drop to the terminal window. If you watch a lot of my videos, you'll see me drop to the terminal window all the time. That's because I grew up in that environment. I grew, we didn't have desktop environments. <laughs> I'm more comfortable in the, desk, in the terminal environment. But you certainly do not have to do that. And, and these videos that I'll be doing coming down the line, I promise I will not drop into the terminal window <laughs> at all. Um, but the main thing is, is that you can go and play around with the applications. There are all Linux distributions, for the most part, have application stores that you can go into. Some of them have been curated for malware and all this kind of nonsense. Uh, they also uh, are, and they'll tell you if they have been or not. And you can pick and choose those and install them and play around with them and see if you like them or not. Um, there's a lot of different choices uh, in the application space. Again, Linux is all about choice. It's not about locking you into a certain way of thinking. Uh, that is, you know, the Microsoft way. It's not about that. It's about being able to find something that works for you. And that's really what Linux is all about. That's why there's so many applications, because somebody will go, I don't really like the way that works, and they'll go off and write it. Um, but have fun, and, and I'll give you some beginning Linux websites that you can go that have kind of some, I promise I'll make sure that they don't have any people. I know some of them have you go directly to the terminal. I don't think that's a good start. I don't think that's necessary. Uh, from in today's world, I, I, if you can't do what you, you need to do on the desktop, then it's not worth pursuing as far as I'm concerned. So. And don't be afraid to dive in. The water's warm. It, it, it's not going to bite you. It's not going to blow up uh, or turn your computer into a giant flaming marshmallow. But uh, yeah, have fun with it. And then really, that's the main thing. So I think I'm gonna. I think what I'll do is stop here <laughs> and and let you get a chance to digest this. Uh, if you have questions, please leave them below. If I can, I will answer them as many as I can. I have used Linux for a very long time, and I've used its predecessor for uh, probably a decade, even prior to that, or decade and a half, actually, prior to that. So well, I'm well familiar with the uh, uh, Linux and Unix community. 
as far as how it operates. So, uh, and, and don't get discouraged. Sometimes you'll hear people read the effing manual, but you know that's part of the grumpy people that are in the Linux community. A lot of us are old and uh, we're intolerant. I'm not one of those guys because I've worked in the support field all my life, so I'm not one of those guys. So hope you enjoyed this. And again, hope to see you all again real soon. And like always, bye for now. Oh, please like and subscribe. Thank you.